초동대응은 빠를수록 완벽할수록 어, 이렇게 좋다. 그리고 그것에 지금 어, 사활이 걸려 있다. 이렇게 저는 말씀드리고 싶습니다. The daily average of confirmed COVID-19 cases in Seoul is reported as 2.9 despite a series of mass infection crises. 서울에서 발생한 집단 감염 가운데 최대 규모의 사례가 나왔습니다. 27명이 추가로 확진된 겁니다. 한 집단 발생 즉각 대응반을 구성해서 역학 조사를 실시하고 있습니다. 위중하게 이 상황을 인식하고 추가 확산을 막기 위해서 최선을 다하고 있습니다. Using mobile access records and credit card transactions, the city government identified more than 1,000 contacts and conducted tests for COVID-19. The government asked for citizens for active cooperation for self-quarantine to prevent a second or third transmission of the virus to the community. Call centers and public facilities across Seoul were disinfected thoroughly. 어, 서울시는 시민 모두가 어, 저희들이 그 요청한 대로의 생활 방역을 철저히 해주셨고 확진 환자 유증상이 발생했을 시에는 각 보건소에 적극적으로 검사를 임해므로서 저희들이 효과를 거두지 않았나 이렇게 생각을 합니다. After the switch from the social distancing to the distancing in daily life in May. An unexpected mass infection occurred at clubs in Itaewon. Based on the experience of mass infection at the Guru Call Center, the city government tracked down the Itaewon visitors working together with the National Police Agency and the mobile service companies. The Seoul Metropolitan Government immediately introduced the anonymous testing and operated additional walkthrough testing stations. 저희가 서울시에서 내게 드라이빙 수급을 의무하면서 수많은 내신 기자들이 취재 요청이 있어서 중수도에 대한 쪽에서 지침도 협조가 오면 그런 걸 많이 제공한 겁니다. 서울시에서는 6월 초부터 선제적 검사라고 해가지고 학생이라든지 어르신들, 가면에 취약한 분들이 있는 장소들을 찾아가서 선제적 검사가 지금 검토 중입니다. As the number of confirmed cases is rising, Seoul is once again checking quarantine countermeasures against COVID-19 and conducting preemptive virus testings. The distancing in daily life has been further tightened, 
We must stay alert to this unpredictable virus. And they are uh, going through a, a sort of more stringent lockdown than we've had here in South Korea because the South Korean government and I guess the, the Seoul government have dealt with the coronavirus in kind of unique ways, particularly in terms of testing and contact tracing and, you know, targeted quarantining. The country's been a, a little bit more successful in keeping the number of cases and the number of deaths down. Well, I think the most important part of, you know, so-called K-quarantine is the contact tracing that needs to take place. In order to contain the virus, you need to know where it came from. And that means that, you know, Western countries, the publics in Western countries are going to need to sacrifice some of their privacy in order for contact tracing to be really effective. That's the biggest lesson that I think uh, other countries and other governments can learn from South Korea's experiencing experience in, in containing the virus. Along with the immediate response of the government, dedication of the frontline medical workers and participation of citizens who practice social distancing made it possible for Korea to be a role model in quarantine measures. Yet, COVID-19 will leave much of an impact on our society. It has changed our daily lives and economic and social damages are also significant. For any possible outbreak in the future, what should we do to prepare? For the world after COVID-19, how can cities in the world cooperate with each other? Now, the world is paying attention to Seoul's next move. I 
Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the discussion on public transportation. I'm Jessica Lee, and today I've been given the honor of being the moderator for this session. And before we begin, we'd like to extend our sincere gratitude for joining us today at this international and virtual conference. Thank you. According to the COVID-19 guidance, close contact refers to staying within two meters of a confirmed case for more than 15 minutes. And public transportations need a special control since there is a risk of mass transmission of virus due to packed people in small spaces. And therefore, for today's discussion, Mr. Puyan Huang, the Deputy Mayor of City Transportation Office of Seoul Metropolitan Government, will give us a presentation, followed by China, Singapore, and the UK's presentation. Then the panelists will share the COVID-19 response cases of sustainable public transportation and discuss cooperative measures to tackle the crisis. And before we begin, for your information, we're running today's discussion live over the English version of Seoul City's YouTube channel in real time. So please do the final check of your webcam, network system, and also your microphone. Thank you very much for your kind cooperation. And first of all, the moderator for today's discussion is Chun Ho Ko, a professor of the Graduate School of Urban Studies at Hanyang University. He worked as a researcher at Seoul Research Institute for 10 years and also accumulated various research experience in the transportation sector. Now let me introduce our presenters and also panelists for, from home and abroad. To begin with, we have Mr. Puyan Huang, a Deputy Mayor of City Transportation Office of Seoul. Today, he will deliver a presentation on the Seoul's transportation policies on making Seoul a green transportation city. And our next presenter is Mr. Long Jun, a deputy director of the Beijing Municipality Commission of Transport. He's a transportation expert in Beijing who built his career at Beijing Underground Railway Corporation. Hello. Nice to meet you and thank you very much for your time. The the next panelist is Jeremy Yeb, the Deputy Chief Executive of Singapore's Land Transport Authority. Hello, nice to meet you. Thank you very much for your time today. And next, we have Ms. Michelle Dix, a Managing Director of Transport for London. She's an expert on transportation who served as the Board Director for Urban Transport of Harcrow Fox. Hello. Hello. Nice to meet you. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. And also, Mr. Mohammed Mezani, a Secretary General of UITP, is joining with us today. And the UITP is an international organization for public transport authorities and operators. Hello. Hello. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for joining us. And last but not least, we have Mr. Guangzhe Chen, a global director for transport practice of Roll Bank Group. Roll Bank is a multilateral development bank fighting poverty worldwide and aiming for the economic development of developing countries. Hello. Hello. Thank nice you very to meet you. much for your time and nice to meet you too. Then and now, today's chairperson will commence the discussion. Professor, the floor is yours. Please begin the session. Okay. Uh, 안녕하십니까. Hello, everyone. Cities Against COVID-19 Global Summit 2020 conference, and we are now in on the session of public transportation. As you are well aware, the world is facing COVID-19, an unprecedented situation. And amidst this crisis situation, it is very difficult to, to operate to public transportation in a normal way. And uh, we would like to use this opportunity to share our experiences and cases on how the transportation sector is responding uh, to the crisis situation. We will first be hearing from 
Bo Young Hwang, Deputy Mayor of the Seoul Metropolitan City Government Transportation Office. And we will be hearing about how Seoul City is responding through its public transportation system uh, against the COVID-19 situation. How has your life changed uh, since COVID-19 broke out? Uh, this invisible virus uh, has upended our lives. COVID-19 has paralyzed uh, the world, but uh, public transport in Seoul and around the world has to keep moving. Public transport in Seoul enables the mobility of citizens and ensures the continuity of the citizens' lives. Now, uh, let me tell you about Seoul's control measures on public transport in the context of COVID-19. I'll first uh, touch upon Seoul's step-by-step -step response uh, to COVID-19, uh, talk about the outcomes and lessons uh, we have learned uh, from COVID-19. Since its uh, first outbreak uh, in the late uh, 2019, the first case in South Korea was announced on January 23rd. Based on the lessons learned from MERS, the Korean government and Seoul City immediately raised the alert level to two, and uh, although the first case was confirmed during the holiday season, the government and the city set up uh, the anti-disaster task force. However, Seoul is a metropolitan city with a population of 10 million, and uh, more than 14 million use public transport on a daily basis. So Seoul had to gear up uh, to prevent mass infection in densely populated areas. So while maintaining basic uh, mobility, Seoul had to prevent mass infection in public transport vehicles while also ensuring the health and safety of its citizens. After the first outbreak on January 23rd, uh, the average number of infected people per day increased by one, uh, leading to a decrease of uh, ridership. Public transportation users have steadily declined. Seoul adopted infection uh, prevention and control measures on public transport uh, with the belief that overreacting is better than slow reacting. Seoul immediately disinfected all public transport vehicles and stations and placed hand sanitizers um, in the public transport system. Seoul City made it mandatory for drivers to wear personal protective equipment. Also, the city disinfected the subway stations inside the subway and bus and taxi stands and placed uh, hand sanitizer dispensers and free masks on subways and buses to help citizens protect themselves against the virus. The city took swift measures. In February, Seoul entered a new phase of COVID-19. On uh, February 23rd, a massive infection of Chintandi Church occurred since then. Uh, Concerns over massive infection became a reality. Schools across the country delayed the opening of schools, and WHO declared a COVID-19 a pandemic. The total number of confirmed cases in Korea has increased to about 10,000, and the number of confirmed cases in Seoul uh, rose to about 600. Seoul was faced with a crisis. Against this backdrop, Seoul had to urgently take preventive measures to prevent large-scale mass infection. The measures consisted of uh, two pillars. First, uh, enhanced uh, quarantine measures. Seoul identified its citizens' contact points and enhanced uh, cleaning and disinfection procedures at a four-time higher level than usual. The city also launched the social distancing campaign to lower uh, the ridership. To tell you more about the enhanced quarantine measures, Seoul enhanced the cleaning and disinfection procedures on subway platforms, waiting rooms, as well as bus stands, elevator buttons, transit smart card vending machines, and bus stop belts. Seoul took meticulous measures with its cleaning, uh, which took place uh, two to eight times more frequent than usual. Since Seoul raised the alert level, uh, the city cleaned and disinfected every inch of the public uh, transport vehicles about uh, 37,000 times in 45 days. Um, to stop uh, the spread of COVID-19 infection, Seoul had to induce uh, lower ridership. To do this, the city carried out a pause for a moment uh, campaign, a fiscal distancing campaign, which urged all citizens to adopt remote uh, work uh, or the alternate day system 
uh, delaying school opening and working from home. At the same time, the city implemented distancing in public transport uh, by carrying out uh, personal etiquette campaigns such as mask use, coughing etiquette, and hand washing. As a result, we were able to reduce ridership by a maximum of 35%. Next, uh, I would like uh, to talk about the Kuro call center mass infection, which posed a huge threat uh, to the use of public transport in Seoul. Mass infection occurred in a call center as workers uh, work uh, in a very dense uh, work environment. Seoul tracked uh, the workers' travel path in a swift manner and confirmed that the majority of Kuro call center employees commuted using public transport such as subway and bus. Seoul cleaned and disinfected all buses operating within 500 meters of Kuro station, as well as 35 nearby subway stations and subway. Fortunately, no infection was identified in public transport, and uh, this proved the effectiveness of uh, Seoul's public transport, which gained the trust of citizens through social distancing. Another example is that of a bus driver who was confirmed as a COVID-19 patient. This driver was the husband of one of the Kuro call center uh, patients, and uh, concerns were raised about a secondary infection. Immediately after the driver was confirmed positive, we stopped the operation of 18 buses on the route, and all 50 drivers were quarantined before the uh, investigation. As a result of our investigation and test of passengers, no secondary infection was identified. This is evidence uh, to the effectiveness of drivers uh, sticking to personal hygiene rules and manuals, such as wearing a driver's mask and practicing uh, social distancing. As mentioned earlier, the number of people using tra public transport uh, dropped sharply by up to 34% since the pandemic. Uh, and by the end of April, as the number of newly confirmed cases went down to around 10 every day, the sense of crisis gradually eased. Citizens who were tired of intensive social distancing returned to their everyday life, and ridership started to go up. Accordingly, the congestion level of public transport in early May went up to 80% of the pre-COVID level. And according to the new trend, it is predicted that the level of congestion before the outbreak of COVID-19 will fully return to the pre-crisis level by the end of June. Of course, it's a good thing that uh, citizens can return to their normal life, but uh, it is a crisis to Seoul as the city has the duty to prevent mass infection among public transport users. We have to guarantee the mobility of the citizens, um, but at the same time, we have uh, to devise new measures to prevent uh, the spread of infection. After all, our biggest concern was to effectively manage congestion, so we had to provide traffic information in advance so that we could reduce traffic congestion, so Seoul built a guidance system that analyzes transportation card data and provides data on traffic congestion real-time to citizens. So congestion in subway uh, is categorized into five levels. At 150 uh, percent, wearing masks uh, becomes mandatory, and uh, standby trains um, are operated to maintain on-time performance. And at 170 uh, percent uh, level, we allow subways uh, to pass through the congestion section without stopping when necessary. Currently, citizens are socially distancing at an ease level, but the level of quarantine is maintained at its highest level to ensure safe traveling of the citizens. Also, when using public transportation, wearing a mask is mandatory. Seoul City has thus installed vending machines in subway stations so that people can buy masks at any time. The mandatory wearing of masks in Seoul began on May 26, and the policy has expanded to and is being implemented at the local as well as central government level. Lastly, let me share Seoul City's outcomes and lessons learned from the response to COVID-19. Our response to COVID-19 for the past 120 days can be summarized into three sentences. First, uh, none of the 916 confirmed cases in Seoul were infected uh, through public transportation. Second, uh, despite the mass infection in Kuro call center and uh, bus driver, uh, which involved uh, public transport, uh, public transport has uh, kept going since the first confirmed case in Seoul. And third, as a result of this uninterrupted service, we were able to gain the citizens' trust that Seoul's public transportation uh, is safe.
In light of these achievements, uh, I would like to share the implications of Seoul's public transportation sector through COVID-19 response, uh, our experience to COVID-19. The first lesson is thorough preventive activities. Since the city raised its alert level, Seoul provided quarantine to the highest level. For example, 278 subway stations and vehicles were disinfected every day. From the end of January to May, the city disinfected the stations and vehicles 37,000 uh, 370,000 times. In the case of buses, a total of 9,069 buses were disinfected daily, which makes it the total to 40,000 times from the end of January to April. And uh, thus, we were able to create a safe uh, environment. The second lesson is uh, the safety management of public transport operators. If uh, the operators are infected, uh, that can paralyze the public transport system and spread the infection to citizens. So to prepare for this, uh, we have prepared manuals uh, for prevention and uh, also post uh, response to prepare for emergencies. Preventive measures include uh, disinfection and service management, closing of dorms, alternate uh, lunch hours, and sitting in a single row during meals. And uh, post uh, measures include immediate replacement of personnel, split work hours, and paid leave. As a result, uh, there has been no cases of transmission infection um, because of public transport workers. Uh, the third lesson is wearing masks at all times. The city of Seoul has consistently emphasized that wearing a mask is the least you can do to prevent infection. Ever since the outbreak of the virus, first of all, we placed masks on subways and buses to um, make sure that citizens wear them and distribute it to citizens free of charge. And for example, the city also distributed 2,000 masks per day to 328 uh, subway stations and placed 100 masks on 9,067 buses. In addition, distancing in daily life encouraged citizens' mandatory mask wearing when using public uh, transport, which became a lifestyle in and of itself. Uh, furthermore, the mandatory use of masks has been greatly appreciated by Seoul citizens, and it then spread uh, nationwide. The fourth lesson is the mature citizenship, uh, citizenship of Seoul citizens. Despite the fatigue caused by the prolonged uh, COVID-19, the driving force behind the economy and the daily life even without a lockdown was mature citizenship. In response to COVID-19, citizens proved to be the vaccine to COVID-19. Uh, most citizens voluntarily uh, wore masks when using public transportation and uh, also practiced uh, social distancing by actively participating in the pause for a more moment uh, campaign. They refrained uh, from going out and holding large gatherings. And uh, also, they agreed to the disclosure of uh, personal information necessary to track uh, COVID-19 unconfirmed cases. So based on this, public transport could be operated without interruption. And fifth, uh, we uh, reduced uh, one hour of operation at midnight uh, for the subways as uh, COVID-19 uh, got prolonged. Uh, many people as well as the subway operators uh, were uh, very much fatigued due to uh, everyday crisis. So we had to make sure that we disinfected all the stations as well as the vehicles, which uh, uh, had to give us enough time uh, to prevent and take all the safety maintenance uh, measures. And uh, we uh, analyzed the data of the visitors, and uh, we were able to identify that late night visitors after 24 uh, o'clock are mostly leisure travelers uh, using entertainment and entertainment facilities, and which is why uh, we shortened the operation by an hour. And number six uh, is uh, the incoming visitors. Uh, control measures because uh, the number of confirmed cases from the inbound visitors uh, increased uh, from 28 percent to 41 percent uh, from the end of March uh, to the beginning of May, which is why we have built a dedicated gate uh, to transport uh, those inbound uh, travelers, and that begins uh, at the airport, uh, and uh, we transport them to their home. And uh, from March for 17 days, uh, we dedicated uh, some buses uh, for those inbound travelers to make sure that uh, we can contain uh, the virus uh, from spreading further. 
to the local residents. And the last lesson is uh, the public goods that we use and also the uh, bicycle service uh, that we provide for the residents. So uh, citizens use the bicycles as a safe uh, measure of uh, transportation and the use of the bicycle uh, increased by 64% uh, during the COVID-19 crisis. So we provided about 100,000 vehicles to the citizens and we plan to increase that to 150 by the end of this year. And uh, of course, uh, people uh, shifted their transportation mode uh, to bicycles, which helped us uh, alleviate um, the traffic uh, for public transportation. So while other modes of transportation decreased by 35% and 5%, uh, the number of ridership uh, for the bicycle increased uh, during the same time. So they now shifted, the citizens now shifted to an eco-friendly mode of transportation. So Seoul City um, will is now shifting to a more eco-friendly uh, mode of transportation, and uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis served as an opportunity to make that shift. So these are the seven lessons that we learned uh, from the COVID-19 uh, response in terms of public uh, transport. Last but not least, uh, I would like to say that COVID-19 is uh, still a crisis, uh, and uh, we have to make sure that we maintain uh, this level of uh, preventive activities, and uh, we need to build a smart mobility for the new normal era. Thank you very much for your time. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Huang, for the presentation. So the city of Seoul is uh, actively responding to COVID-19 with a series of uh, actions. And you talked about uh, seven cases, uh, seven policies uh, that uh, the city took uh, to fight COVID-19. And uh, you talked about uh, the no interruption in the public transport services uh, during COVID-19. That was quite impressive. And you also talked about uh, the ridership for the bicycle uh, provided by Seoul City, Taringi, which increased by 60%. Thank you very much. Next, we will be hearing about uh, overseas cases responding to COVID-19. First, we will be hearing from Beijing, a city that has a population of over 20 million. We will be hearing from Deputy Director Rong Zhong. You may start. Dear colleagues, it's good to join you in this evening. I would like to thank the Seoul Metropolitan Government for providing this valuable opportunity for international exchanges on the prevention and control of COVID-19 in transport industry. Now I would like to brief you on the situation here in Beijing. Uh,疫情发生以后呢, Beijing市疫情防控工作在中央政府的统一领导下，外防输入、内防扩散，到目前本地的疫情已经得到了有效控制，境外输入也已经被阻断。截止到五月三十一日，已经连续四十六天输入性病例和本地病例都是为双零增
。二零一九年，铁路航空客运量达到三点八七亿人次，疫情防控呢难度很大。因此，我们在第一时间就启动了突发公共卫生事件的一级假名机制，在全市各领域、各行业实施了最严格的防控措施，交通领域的防控工作同时启动。Looking back at the previous phase of epidemic prevention and control work in the city, there are three main characteristics. The first is prompt response and decisive measures. As a megacity with a permanent population of more than 21 million, Beijing is also an international travel hub. In 2019, railway and air passenger traffic capacity reached 387 million. It is difficult to prevent and control the epidemic. So the first level of public health emergency response mechanism was initiated at the earliest time possible. The most stringent prevention and control measures were implemented in all fields and industries, and the prevention and control work in the transport industry was also conducted. 按时发挥体制的优势，统筹开展防控工作。北京成立了疫情防控领导小组，由副市长牵头的交通保障组，其中不仅有市交通委这样的城市交通管理部门，还有由国家直接管理的铁路、民航等部门参加。昨日将城市、城际交通都纳入到交通防控工作体系中来，实现了高效指挥、统一步调、协同防控。The second is to give full play to the advantages of the system and coordinate prevention and control work. Beijing has set up a leading group for epidemic prevention and control and has set up a transportation support team led by the deputy mayor. The team not only consists of city traffic management departments such as Beijing Municipal Commission of Transport, but also railway and civil aviation departments directly administered by the state. In this way, city and intercity transportation were incorporated into the traffic prevention and control work system, achieving efficient command, unified pace, and coordinated prevention and control. 三是依靠科技手段提供呃提高防控效率，充分利用大数据摸排确诊者的轨迹以及密切接触者等信息，并通过数据共享实现对铁路、民航、公路进京人员的排查，将高高风险人员拦截在售票前、远端出发前，降低长途旅行引起的传播风险，严把进京的入口关。The third is to improve efficiency through technological means. We make full use of big data to identify the trajectory of confirmed cases and their close contacts, and data sharing to screen personnel entering Beijing by railway, airplane, and highway, intercept high-risk personnel before ticket sales and long-distance travel, thus reducing the risk of spreading caused by long-distance travel and controlling their entrance to Beijing. 第二个方面，介绍一下应急状态下北京交通行业的防控措施。按照全市疫情防控工作的要求，交通行业采取了进京交通防输入、室内交通防扩散、从业人员防感染的策略。截止到目前，北京市还没有发生一起因为交通场站或乘坐公共交通工具引发的疫情传播和扩散。Second, prevention and control measures for transport in an emergency response period. According to the requirements of the city's epidemic prevention and control work, the transportation industry has adopted the strategy of preventing imported cases from abroad by checking transport entering Beijing and virus spreading, by controlling transport within the city and the infection of staff. Up until now, There has not been a single case caused by traffic stations or traffic means. 普遍性的防护措施主要是按照国家交通运输部对于交通场站、交通工具的防控要求和北京市公共交通防疫指南的要求，在交通场站和工具均采取了通风、消毒、测温、戴口罩等措施。General prevention and control measures, in accordance with the requirements of the Ministry of Transport for the prevention and control work of the transport stations and means, and the Beijing Municipal Public Transport Epidemic Prevention Guidelines, the transportation stations and vehicles in Beijing have adopted measures such as ventilation, disinfection, temperature check, and wearing masks. 场站和交通工具的消毒主要是根据乘客接触的频繁程度。
对消毒频次进行了详细的规定。以轨道车站为例，对频繁接触的自助售票机等，每小时消毒一次；对经常接触的电梯扶手，以及站台站厅等部位，每四小时消毒一次。The frequency of disinfection of stations and vehicles is determined according to the frequency of services touched by passengers. Take railway station as an example. The self-service ticketing equipment frequently used by passengers is disinfected once per hour. The handrails of elevator frequently touched are disinfected once every four hours. The less frequently touched areas such as platforms and halls are disinfected once every four hours. 在乘客管理方面，凡是乘坐公共交通工具的，呃，乘客必须佩戴口罩，也必须接受测温。温度异常的乘客将按照程序由医护人员迅速送往发热门诊就诊。As for passenger management, passengers must wear masks on public transport and must have their temperature checked. People with abnormal temperature will be sent to the fever clinics by medical staff. 在从业人员保护方面，北京市一直将交通行业的一线工作人员作为防护物资的重点保障对象，配发口罩和防护服，有效保护了从业人员的安全。截止到目前，八十万交通从业人员没有发生感染的情况。As for the protection of staff, the city has always regarded frontline workers in the transportation industry as one of the key recipients for protective materials and has distributed masks and protective gowns to effectively protect the safety of our employees. Up to now, none of our 800,000 employees was infected. In the city of Shenzhen, 一级响等级下，满载率控制在百分之五十以内。下调二级以后，满载率上调为百分之九十。为了满足这一要求，我们在疫情初期，客运量仅达到常态的百分之三十左右时，运力投入已经基本上达到常态水平。客运量大的通勤线路还采用了加开、区间车等方式来增强运力。Urban traffic management measures, first in terms of buses. Under the first level response, the load rate is capped at 50%. After the response level is lowered to the second level, the load rate is increased to 90%. In order to meet this requirement, we basically reach the normal public transport capacity when the passenger volume in the early stage just reached about 30% of the normal level. In addition, we increased the shuttle bus to increase the capacity of commuter lines with large passenger traffic. 轨道交通方面，在一级一级等级下，满载率也同样控制在百分之五十以内。下调二级以后，上调为百分之八十。为降低高峰客流量，我们还创新推出了地铁预约进站，即鼓励乘客通过预约第二天早高峰轨道进站的时间，以十五分钟为间隔，获得不同时段的进站预约码。尺码按时进站，可以使用专用通道，减少排队时间，以此来引导乘客错峰出行，提高进站效率。As for the rail transit, under the first level response, the load rate is capped at 50%. After the response level is lowered to the second level, the load rate is increased to 80%. In order to reduce the peak flow of passenger traffic, we've introduced a creative method of appointment-based travel, which encourages passengers to reserve the next day's entry time with 15-minute intervals to obtain an appointment code. Passengers who hold the code can enter the station without waiting, thus reducing the queuing time. This move guides passengers to tra travel at different peaks and improve the efficiency of railway stations. 共享单车的运营企业为提高自行车消毒效率，发起了无差别消毒的活动。运维人员不区分车辆品牌，开展共享单车的联合消毒，保障车辆的使用安全。As for bicycle use, to improve the bicycle disinfection efficiency, bike-sharing companies launched a Disinfect All Bikes campaign. Operation and maintenance personnel carried out joint disinfection of shared bikes without their, regardless of their brands or affiliation, to ensure the passenger safety while using the shared bikes. 
。在此期间，我们还暂停了按照车牌尾号进行限行的这一缓解交通拥堵的措施，从而方便市民在疫情防控期间选择私家车出行。During these、uh, countermeasures, we have also suspended the car usage res restriction, which is devoted to mitigate the traffic congestion. In the road safety area, the Metro Rail Corporation has suspended the entire road in the Hubei region. After a suitable level of safety is achieved, the road safety has resumed. After the outbreak of the pandemic, the Metro Rail Corporation has established a B-Quarantine system. 实施了入境人员全部进行核酸检测、集中隔离十四天等措施，阻断境外疫情的输入性风险。Intercity traffic management, first railway and civil aviation, we suspended all traffic to and from Hubei in the early stage of the outbreak and gradually lifted this rule in an orderly manner only after the response level was lowered to the second. After the pandemic broke out overseas, we put in place a closed-loop management mechanism, which include measures such as nucleic acid tests and 14-day quarantine in designated facilities for all overseas arrivals. The mechanism is quickly block the imported risk of COVID-19. Uh, cross-border 低风险地区的线路，并且严格实施信息采集、健康码核查等措施。All interprovincial passenger transport and cross-province travel by chartered buses were suspended since the outbreak. After the response level was lowered, we resumed the lines in low-risk areas and implemented measures such as information collection and health code verification. 第三个方面，介绍一下在疫情防控常态化。这个前提下的一个交通工作思路，目前呢，北京市的疫情防控形势持续向好，应急响应等级已由一级下调到二级，近期还将进一步下调到三级。我们在疫情进入长期这个防控的常态化阶段之后，交通的可持续发展主要有以下几个方面的考虑。The third part, regular epidemic prevention and control. With the epidemic stabilized in our city, the emergency response level has been lowered from level one to two and will be adjusted downward to level three in the near future. However, since the virus will not disappear in the short run, our focus is to adapt to the regular epidemic prevention and, and control as soon as possible. And I propose the following ideas. One 在疫情期间，我们推出了点对点的出行、预约售票的定制通勤公交服务，受到了市民的广大欢迎。下一步，我们结合的学校逐步复课，还将推出通学的定制公交线路，进一步丰富公交出行的选择。First, innovate public transportation development. For example, during the epidemic period, the city's buses launched a customized point-to-point -point travel and booking system, an effort welcomed by the public and citizens. Next step will be a school route to accommodate students' demand for resumption of classes and offer them more travel choices. Ivan全面实施非急诊预约挂号、公园、景点、博物馆等公共场所实行预约游览。群众性活动也采取了分时段预约的模式。下一步，北京市将固化和延续这些预约出行的方式，包括进一步扩大地铁预约进站等试点，
Third, encourage bicycle rides. On the one hand, increase investment to build exclusive bicycle roads, non-motorized demonstration area. On the other hand, organize the city's e-rental business operators to launch promotion promotional activities such as morning and evening peak hour discounts to incentivize bicycle travel. Fourth, summarize the experience learned from this epidemic prevention and control and improve the transportation industry's operation and management standards, response procedures, material reserves, and other systems and programs during emergencies. 通過這次研討會,我們也將學習借鑑其他國際城市的經驗,進一步完善北京的做法,也希望能夠繼續保持和大家的溝通交流,共同抗擊疫情,探索交通可持續發展之路。謝謝。I believe after the seminar, I will learn more from the experiences of other metropolises to improve our practices and maintain communication with all others to jointly fight the epidemic and explore the Sustainable development of transport industry. Thank you. 네, 소중한 경험을 공유해 주신 베이징 교통. Thank you very much, Deputy Director Long Jun, for sharing your um, infer cases. And uh, I uh, heard that uh, through your presentation that you are uh, controlling the load. And uh, in addition to that, uh, that uh, you are trying to utilize appointment systems. And uh, it seems that you are providing uh, customized services in order to respond proactively to COVID-19. Once again, thank you for your presentation. Next, uh, Deputy Chief Executive Jeremy Yap of uh, LTA will present uh, the case of Singapore. And uh, as you know, uh, Singapore's uh, public transport policy has long served as a benchmark uh, for other countries. And I look forward uh, to the case of Singapore. The floor is now yours, uh, Deputy Chief Executive. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Ano Seo. Uh, I'm so happy to be at the conference. Uh, thank you for this privilege to be able to share and also a very good to be among colleagues from the UITP family. Uh, by way of quick background, Singapore is an island city-state of approximately 700 square kilometers. We have a population of 5.8 million. So that gives us a density of about 8,000 inhabitants per square kilometer. Our public transport system carries about 7.3 million trips daily if you count only public buses and metro. So about 4 million on public buses and about 3.3 million on metro. Uh, what we call shared transport, which is our taxis and our, our right bike sharing, uh, private hire cars, carry about 1 million. So all in all, uh, if you redefine public transport to include some of these shared transport, uh, we carry close to 8.3 million trips per day. Uh, I, I wanted to share that our mindset has been that uh, ever since we encountered COVID, throughout the journey, we wanted to maintain a mental model of how to emerge stronger. It's not just to survive the crisis because many would be in the same uh, situation, but we wanted to make sure that we come out of this much stronger. And I'll share a little bit more about this. So my presentation will cover four parts. First, I'll share about the evolution of the COVID situation in Singapore and the overarching public communication strategy to reinforce public confidence in our public transport network. Then I'll talk a little bit about what we call our circuit breaker. Uh, it's a little bit like a quasi lockdown, but I shall explain why we use the term. Uh, then I'll talk about specific measures de uh, developed for public transport. And lastly, I'll talk about some of the new norms uh, for public transport as we transit from what we call uh, safe distancing into safe management. Again, I will say a little bit more about this and how we can take advantage of uh, opportunities to sharpen and to refine our land transport strategies. Well, Winston Churchill says, uh, never waste a good crisis. And this is uh, very true of the pandemic here for us in Singapore. We in public transport sector should look beyond the normal operations and the, uh, and the 
and the fight against the virus now, but take the opportunity to validate, to reform, as well as transform our public transport strategy. It's a chance to improve the system. So how, what is our journey? So we had our first case in 20, on 23rd of January, uh, but we still had our airports and our seaports open and uh, local transmission was starting to develop in February and March and the numbers started to grow. And so to counter this, we had a few challenges because businesses continue to function, uh, schools remain open, uh, public transport ridership was high. We still had about 2 million trips a day. So we carry about uh, 7.3 million. So we had a fair share of over 2 million trips still uh, ongoing. During public uh, peak, uh, peak hour travels, it was almost impossible to practice safe uh, distancing because uh, it was just uh, too, too, too much of a ridership to uh, allow a one meter distancing or 1.5 meter, depending on, on, on where you are and, and what is your yardstick. Um, so on 7th April, uh, we, we kicked in circuit breaker measures to preempt uh, the increasing local transmission within one community spread. So we preemptively kicked it in and we elevated the self uh, safe distancing measures to reduce uh, more movements and interactions publicly in the, in the public and private space. And, uh, and so the, the government looked at the various transmissions within the community and allow select businesses to later on gradually reopen uh, in the midst of the circuit breaker. And then since the uh, 2nd of June, Singapore uh, has transited into the next phase in dealing with the COVID pandemic, which is what I said earlier, from safe distancing into safe management. So the consistency of messaging is very important and that has served us well in Singapore. First, what am I talking about? Because in, in some cities, you know, public transport was discouraged once uh, COVID uh, came on the scene. But we were careful to preserve uh, the vital utility of public transport. So through our messaging, we continue to say that public transport is a critical economic enabler and an essential service. Secondly, that we must continue uh, to make public transport a safe uh, place. Uh, and I'm happy to say that, you know, looking at the public transport employees spread across 20,000 uh, 20, of them spread across the public transport facilities and all that, we only have about around about 17 infections uh, from these workers and, and, and all of these are in, in the process of recovery. So again, the messaging is important. Public transport only has a, a, a context that are transient. And uh, so in the transient nature, uh, you know, the, the exchanges are very short and the exposure and the risk is low. And that we continue to push out as a message to make sure that public transport remain an essential service and a vital utility. And, and lastly, it is about personal hygiene. It is about monitoring your own health. It's about uh, your own temperature, whether you're free brow or not, and to wear a face mask. So these were some of the consistent messaging that went throughout the whole uh, period and continue to do so. So wh why do we call it our circuit breaker? Uh, our, our health minister, Mr. Gang Kim Yong, he's also an electrical engineer by training. So he coined this phrase, when something goes wrong in the electrical system, the circuit breaker will trip to prevent any short circuit. But, so we have to turn off the circuit breaker to cut off the trip, but at the same time, we turn off everything. So as we turn back on the circuit breaker, we can slowly switch on, switch by switch, to see where is the trip. So that whole concept of uh, you know a circuit breaker and then gradual uh, easing of, of measures is built upon this concept of identifying where are the sources of the community spread, the clusters, and all that. Now I'll talk a little bit about how we unfolded into the circuit breaker. So for the circuit breaker period, we practice safe distancing on public transport. Uh, Non-essential uh, workplaces and schools were closed after 7th April. And on public transport, we calibrated the on the demand side and the supply side because we looked at the demand and then we tailored the supply. So we maintained train and bus service headways that were pre-COVID. That means we ran at a very high capacity because uh, we didn't want uh, you know, crowding in the system. That's to assure that public transport is a safe uh, space. And uh, the frequency of higher demand services, we added bus services where needed uh, because buses sometimes, because it's a more confined space, so 
actually the psychology is different on buses. Uh, so as far as the, the some of the bus services to cut costs, uh, some of the buses that went to tourist uh, attractions and zoos and all that, we cut them off in, in order to properly reallocate uh, resources. And we implemented safe distancing markers. I'll have pictures to show you later on. But let's uh, turn to the ridership. So in terms of the ridership, we fell from uh, pre-COVID uh, numbers. Uh, we fell, we had a reduction of about 80% in the middle of the circuit breaker. So public transport fell 80% uh, in terms of the ridership. Now, this is a summarized figure across both bus and rail, but I can tell you that for uh, truck, for metro, it fell a lot more than buses. Uh, so, But it was around that number, uh, ranging from 70 to 80% across both buses and trains. And then when I look across to the private higher side of the house, or the taxi, what we call point-to-point -point services, uh, that also experienced a 75% drop in ridership uh, from pre-COVID levels. Why am I telling this? Uh, I'm telling you this because it's important as we calibrate the measures for public transport. So in the next section, I will share some of these measures. So you probably asked, uh, what are we doing with these measures? So firstly, uh, what do we want to achieve? We want to continue to instill commuters' confidence and rebuild that trust in public transport that was lost when people feared uh, crowded places. Secondly, to encourage social responsible behavior in commuters. Last but not least important is to maintain a very positive, uh, confident and healthy workforce because when the workforce is healthy and the public transport workforce is healthy and they are confident, it projects positiveness into the uh, public transport environment and uh, system. And so this was our mantra. This was how we, we shaped up uh, in terms of the system and the consistency of messaging was, uh, was continuing throughout this period. Next, I'll share a little bit about our sanitation for the system. And so just like many other cities have shared uh, Seoul and, and, uh, and, and Beijing before, and I'm sure uh, many cities across the world have done this. So as the sanitation level were brought up, uh, we stepped up the cleaning uh, more than once a day uh, for the assets and also the common touch points. Uh, we applied a lot of the new technology in terms of the antimicrobial self-disinfecting coating, and we also stepped up uh, cleaning and disinfecting of the premises themselves. And so this has served us well, and I, and I think we'll continue to do this. So, so this is part, going to be part of the new norm. What did we do for precise safe distancing? We had uh, standing stickers mark markers. We had markers where you are prohibited from sitting, so alternate uh, seat arrangements in both buses and trains, and then queue markers at bus berths and train platforms. Now, we were only able to implement safe distancing because the rest of the wider safe distancing measures across the other sectors were, were helping us, such as the aggressive telecommuting, the shutdown of schools and all that. So if those other measures were not kicked in, it is very challenging uh, to implement uh, safe distancing because of the high ridership numbers. So next, I'll tell you a little bit about the campaigning for safe distancing. So we went uh, very aggressively on uh, infographics to make sure that there's a great comprehension, a great reach of what we wanted to instill as socially responsible behaviours. Various platforms, whether they be digital, print, social media, they went out in, 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 in a great array. Uh, broadcast messages were also constantly being played in the transport nodes of trains and buses, helping to reinforce uh, the message. <coughs> Uh, this is something of a unique factor in Singapore. And, you know, the aviation industry has suffered heavily. Uh, you know, stewardess and stewards found themselves uh, displaced uh, with no job. So cabin crew, cabin crew and taxi drivers that were displaced were, were then appointed as transport ambassadors. This was a win-win because it increased our manpower demand to enforce safe distancing while extending help to cabin crew and taxi drivers and the, where the industry was badly hit, as I, as I said before. So these transport ambassadors were so used to serving commuters on board trains uh, projected a very cordial, uh, persuasive nudging factor, and commuters largely were compliant. Of course, with, as with any society, there are those that are egregious, 
egregious and uh, those who uh, were not compliant. And so we had to then use uh, some form of enforcement to ensure that these were uh, prosecuted and they faced uh, some fines because uh, we didn't want it to set a bad example for the rest of the commuters and the other commuters deserve to be kept safe. All right, now, going on, in, in terms of the other measures, we had uh, operational trials with mandatory thermal scanning at select stations, so commuters had to go through uh, this before they, they boarded uh, public transport. And uh, if you were shown to be freebound, we will ask you to see a doctor and uh, ask you not to board the public transport. Now, we, we are moving away from this and into the temperature self-check kiosks uh, post-COVID, and there will be uh, close to about 70 of them placed in stations and us interchanges. And this will, uh, this will inculcate the same socially responsible behavior. Commuters are asked to volunteer if they have not taken their own temperature. So this will not be mandatory, but it will be it will be voluntary and it will be self self check kiosks. And then we also proliferated to the great degree hand sanitizers uh, at, at all the public transport infrastructure, so commuters can avail themselves to that. This is all part of building up physical safety as well as psychological safety in the public transport system. And then for our staff, as I said, twice a day, they will have a regime of taking temperatures. They looked after each other. Safe distancing measures were adopted at, uh, at workplaces when they, where they add. Uh, face masks, sanitizers, and health supplements were, were, prov were provided. Uh, and, 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 and this helped to keep the force, uh, keep the employees of public transport, 20,000 of them, uh, very healthy, confident, and positive. What about the financial sustainability? So we looked at the cost and the revenue side. Now, a lot of our broad-based uh, uh, finances went into the cost side because on the cost side, uh, we had to look at cost, cash, and credit. So, so, so a lot of our stimuli packages went into that. Uh, we had, we have announced four packages in the tune of 100 billion Singapore dollars. And we have, uh, we have drawn even from our reserves, and this is about 20% of Singapore's GDP up to now. So looking across, you can see that job support scheme very quickly, this is really just to co-pay uh, salaries, so to keep the people in their jobs. So we co-pay uh, 50 to 25% in the initial months during the circuit breaker, we paid up to 75%. So that kept people in their jobs. A lot of the public transport workers are there for also foreign workers, especially the bus drivers. So foreign worker levy helped uh, the public transport operators as well. And, uh, and, and then wage credit scheme really talks about some of the wage increments. And this is, uh, this of course, up the levels whereby the government was able to share more of the wage increases, again, to keep people in their jobs motivated and all that. Senior employment, and these are people who up, are drawing up to $4,000, they're 55 years old. Uh, there's some help here to keep some of our senior bus captains and senior train staff still in the employ. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the company side, we, we we were liberal in terms of giving them uh, tax rebate up to 100% uh, of tax rebate for non-residential. Uh, and then also on the corporate income tax rebate side, we gave up to 25% for all companies. So all these benefited the, the companies who then were able to pass on some of these savings uh, to their employees as well. So all in all, we tried to keep this moving. And then on the private hire side of the house, or the point-to-point -point service, uh, which I shared also experienced a 75% ridership drop. We, we, we rolled out close to 200 million uh, of, of, of support packages together with the train of uh, the taxi operators as well as the, the ride share operators. So they came in various things here. I want to elaborate too much for the sake of time. Uh, but next, I will share with you the new norms and opportunities for public transport. And this is, the, this is very important for us to share as we have drawn insights. First, uh, in terms of the new norms, I think this will be with us for some time, the transition into safe management measures because safe distancing is not possible on public transport. The wearing of masks is important. Recently, we just announced that it must be a face mask, not a face shield, uh, even as we improve the psychology of public transport uh, safety for commuters. And then we, of course, had shared already about the enhanced uh, cleaning uh, regimes. And then the socially responsible behaviors. I just wanted to highlight here that we have uh, a safe entry QR code at various places in the public transport system. Uh, 
system, uh, computers are encouraged uh, to scan the QR code and also to have it installed on their phones and trace together. And that will help us tremendously in terms of contact tracing. Again, one of those measures to create that psychological and physical safety. So last but not least, uh, this is a picture of the post-COVID, uh, uh, post-circuit uh, breaker, uh, back of pardon. So this is after we have, uh, you can see that the stickers are all removed. People have got into a habit of uh, even sitting in alternative seats where possible. And uh, so this is what we wanted to see from something that we, 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 we set mark on to something that is behavioral in the new norm. And then they will also refrain from talking because we found that certain activities would, would tend to uh, promulgate uh, droplets. And so we were, we were going to advise and we have advised commuters to, to cease from talking when they're on public transport, even when talking to each other uh, or talking on the phone. Yeah. And so what does it mean for the opportunities for public transport? This is my last slide. So we need to determine the shifts and the new uh, travel norms. I think it's a great chance to decongest the peak, to optimize the network, uh, to, uh, to look at the non-peak direction. All the dreams that transport planners have wanted, but now we have an excellent opportunity. It is the best opportunity now to raise the health quality of the public transport system, build that resistance so that come what may, other pandemics may break out, that level of, of cleaning and disinfectant and sanitation and public transport augurs well, it will draw more people eventually. And we must resolve not to just improve the pull side of the house, but the push side of the house is important to strengthen car ownership and usage restraints because people may have this psychology of going back to private transport and that's what we don't want absolutely so uh, our car ownership controls our unit uh, usage controls continue to be in place and continue continue to be reinforced and uh, this uh, and what we have seen is that it, it, it actually falls very nicely into our walk cycle ride strategies for our land transport master plan which is 20 minute towns 45-minute city, transport for all, inclusive, healthy lives, safer journeys. Uh, because we found that local travel has, has increased. So we are aggressively going to bring forward some of those goals to build more cycling infrastructure, as both speakers before me have alluded to. I think the intensive travel locally will, will outstrip some of the long-distance travel. So we have adjusted and will continue to adjust some of these land transport strategies. I thank you very much for your attention, uh, for listening to me. Uh, this is really Really, my last slide and my concluding slide is really to say, let's really uh, emerge stronger. Thank you very much. 네, Jeremy, yeah, 부총장님, 감사합니다. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. Yes, uh, so uh, wearing mask uh, is mandatory in Singapore, just like in Seoul. And uh, you also uh, talked about, uh, you know, um, the stickers that you placed uh, on the subways uh, and buses. Uh, that was uh, quite cute, actually. Anyway, um, we are behind uh, schedule, but uh, last but not least, um, we will be hearing from London, and uh, London is famous for its uh, red double-decker buses and has been operating uh, the tube for 150 years. And it is a leader in public transportation, and I'm sure there are many efforts being put in place uh, to respond to the pandemic. Let us hear from Michelle Dix. Hello, and thank you very much for inviting me to um, join the presentation and to listen to all our colleagues um, about what they've said. I'm just waiting for my presentation to become big. Um, it hasn't done so here. Um, has it become big for you? Good. Um, it's come big for me. So uh, many of the things that I will say are very similar to those that my colleagues across the world have said as well. Um, our lockdown, though, came later than most other people. The virus came to, to London later than it did to many other countries. And what we've had to do, like uh, many of you, is we've actually had to respond to the virus coming to ensure that actually um, during the peak of the virus, we discouraged all but essential travel to ensure that our health workers get, could get to hospitals, our teachers could get to schools, um, people who were involved in the sort of um, delivery industry to make sure food uh, could get delivered. Um, they were allowed to travel on our systems, but we had to discourage everyone else from traveling. 
Uh, we were very successful in discouraging travel and our tube ridership was down by 95%. So only 5% of our normal demand was on the tube service and buses were down by 85%. So only 15% of normal usage. Um, that actually was successful in helping with the virus. But as far as we're concerned, as far as Transport for London is concerned, we're a, a, a unique authority in the sense that we receive no direct revenues um, to fund our day-to-day -day operations. So losing all that revenue has a significant impact on the cost of our services. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, we have had a whole load of measures that we've introduced over time, as many of you had. There's uh, been a gradual relaxation since the 10th of May, and obviously we're starting on the road to recovery, and I'll say a little bit more about what we're doing. Um, but what we want to ensure is that the benefits of COVID, particularly in terms of reduced air pollution, um, more active travel, as Jeremy was referring to, um, less CO2 that we can capture going forward. Um, as with um, all the other sort of like cities, certainly making sure that public transport is clean has been vital to us maintaining our services and making pe sure people feel happy when they are on our services. So cleaning regimes everywhere. One thing that we uh, have been using is a sort of special antiviral disinfectant that will protect services for um, up to 30 days. Uh, we've used it on our tube trains, on the underground, um, on the overground, at coach stations, on buses. Um, at bus stops, making sure that we can actually keep the services clean as well as for normal cleaning regimes. Um, what has been most important is making sure we keep uh, touch points clean. So where people are touching all the time, uh, we've been applying this sort of like the antiviral cleaners to those as well on a very regular basis. Um, cab drivers, uh, making sure their cabs are particularly clean, the garages, the restrooms. Uh, and bus shelters. We've got 14,000 bus shelters all around London, um, and we've been sort of like keeping them clean with antiviral wipe down as well. Also, that people um, feel safe on our systems, but at the same time, we have been sort of trying to discourage um, the use of our systems unless uh, travel was essential. Much of our success in keeping the demand on the network down has been through our briefings with our key stakeholders, and in particular, businesses. They played a vital role in supporting our agenda throughout the peak of the crisis, and they continue to play a vital role. Uh, we've had to say that safety is our top priority. We want to um, reopen London, but what we've asked people to continue to do, which they did during the peak of the crisis, is if they can work at home to continue to do so. Many businesses have been quite successful at working from home. Many of them are choosing to stay working from home. Um, but even though we've said since the 10th of May that um, people who can't readily work from home can come back and use our services, um, many people have chosen to continue working at home, which is really, really important. Um, we've also sort of like said to people who want to come back to work, so they can't readily work from home, can you do so outside of peak hours? Can you sort of like uh, just look at your, uh, your journey times um, to try and avoid the busiest period? Um, that we operate our services, particularly the morning peak. Can you avoid um, taking uh, routes that involve lots of interchange? Because we don't want lots of interchange taking place. Um, and can, if you can at all, can you walk or cycle instead? Um, whether or not it's for all of your journey or just part of your journey. And that's been an ongoing uh, key message that we've sort of put out to our key stakeholders and to our, um, and to our businesses in particular. So, moving forward, um, social distancing is a key issue in terms of uh, making sure we can get back to work, but get back to work safely, as many of you have said. Within the UK, our social distance requirement is two metres. Um, I know elsewhere in the world, uh, with the World Health Authority they talk, organisation, they talk about a metre. Other places, it might be 1.5, but here, and I think in Canada, it's two metres. To maintain that social distance on our tube and bus means that we can only carry up to 13% of our normal tube passengers and up to 15% of our normal bus passengers. Um, so we are still operating at a very low level of um, demand, albeit we're operating at a full as level of service as we can provide. Um, that's why it's really important that we take other measures when we're um, 
on the system, not only having um, social distancing markers everywhere, but also encouraging our, st our, our, our staff and our customers to wear masks. They're not mandatory in the UK yet, but certainly we've learned a lot from many other countries who've um, introduced mask um, wearing and made it mandatory about the sort of effectiveness of that. Customers do have to wait before they enter stations. Uh, they have to go through one-way systems. And we're asking them, as I say, to maintain um, social distancing throughout their journey. Um, whether it's up the escalators, staying to like six steps apart, um, uh, or whether it's sort of standing on the platforms. As with many of you, and sort of Jeremy said it as well, um, also having hand sanitizers um, at our stations so customers can use them before and after travel, as well as we have hand them out to all our staff. Um, and they're on the, the, like the uh, bus stations, they're on the Emirates airline, the DLR stations, on the river piers. Really, really important that people have access to hand sanitizers. Our face coverings, um, we first of all recommended people wear them. Now we're saying much more clearly, you should wear them. Um, and I think that message will get stronger because of the importance of wearing face coverings, particularly as uh, some more people come back to our tube we're still only at 90% of the um, normal loadings. But as more people do come back, as we unlock the um, non-essential retail, that's proposed uh, next week, as we sort of like allow secondary schools to come back, then our services will get more crowded. So I think we'll have stronger messaging. As I say, a key issue for us, though, has been the um, loss of revenue. It's great that we've been able to reduce the demand on the public transport service, but we've lost the revenue as a consequence of that. And much of our uh, money to operate Transport for London comes from the revenues that we gain. So we have asked the government for a package, an emergency package, that will sustain us um, through to October. We had our own reserves, we built up reserves, but it cost us £600 million um, pounds a month to run our services. And, uh, as you can, and we have to maintain a minimum reserve, so we absolutely needed some government support. We've got a grant of 1.9 um, billion, well, it's a package of 1.9 billion, of which 1.6 is grant, and the rest is sort of like made up in, 1.1 um, is grant, and the rest is made up in, in, in loans. Um, it's really important, though, that we seek to uh, get a grant that takes us beyond October. At the moment, uh, that grant allows us to continue operating our services until October, but we want one that takes us through uh, the crisis. And what no one's sure about is how long this crisis will last and where, when the second peak, if there's a second peak, will arise. Uh, so we're really good to get that, um, that sort of package from the government. But um, in return for the package, we have to uh, put the congestion charge up um, we wanted to re reintroduce the congestion charge, unlike, um, um, I think, the Beijing said they hadn't reintroduced their sort of like car restraint measures. We did want to reintroduce our car restraint measures to deter people from going to cars rather than sort of like either staying at home, walking, cycling, or travelling locally. Um, but, but we've had to put the charge up, and we've also had to extend the hours of operation of the congestion charge, such as it's seven days a week and it operates from seven till ten rather than five days a week and only operating from seven till six. Um, we've also got to put the fares up um, from RPI plus one from January. Um, and we have sort of like regular reporting to the government on our sort of like um, financial performance. And we'll have two government appointed representatives attend our board meetings. Um, so that, that's what we'll have to do going forward and say we're in ongoing discussions with government about further support. We have been using travel demand management measures um, extensively throughout our services to sort of keep the services running, um, getting the service back to 100% and making sure that sort of we do encourage more people to walk and cycle. Um, we've had to provide more space, though, for people to walk and cycle. Um, and we've done a lot of sort of like temporary work, which we hope we can convert into more permanent work by creating new space on the road network. So what was before a bus lane, we've now made a place for pedestrians to walk and move the buses further out. Um, we've also sort of like, um, implemented about 16 um, cycling schemes across London, again, taking space 
um, put it in temporarily for now, but we'll make it more permanent as, as, as we go on to provide more space for people to be able to cycle. And we want to see a sort of a tenfold increase in cycling and a fivefold increase in um, walking post the lockdown. So we'll be rapidly putting these schemes in so that we continue to enable more people to walk and cycle whilst we sort of like have to sort of um, ensure that we've got social distancing on our public transport network, but equally also on our walking and cycling um, networks. And we've been doing this, to say, all over London, not just in central London, but importantly, what we're very keen on doing is providing more space for people in their local areas. Jeremy referred to, to like more local trips. People who've worked from home have been going to their local town centres to um, get their goods and, and, and medicines, etc. And, and as we have more of an unlocked down, it's trying to more actively encourage people to walk and cycle in those local areas. So going local is very much part of the way that we want um, the uh, strategy for London to develop. Um, and I say it is good there is more walking and cycling um, taking place. And there's also more opportunity for speeding some of the innovation that's um, happening. You'll see at the bottom there the e-scooters. Um, e-scooters are illegal um, in the UK. They're used extensively in other countries, but we are going to do trials. The government's doing trials on whether or not we can make e-scooter use uh, safer um, to limit them to the speeds that they can go to, to 12 uh, miles an hour. Um, and, and, and to be able to use those as part of the uh, route to recovery. Dr. Cycles schemes, our own Santander cycling scheme has seen record levels of usage um, in the past couple of weeks with some 440,000 uh, last weekend, which is pretty amazing. We've got sort of like special on-demand bus services that will explore more, a little bit like the um, customised public transport trips that I think um, our colleague from Beijing referred to. Um, we've been trialling those in, in, in two places in London. We want to roll out that more. But I think also in terms of trying to promote our public transport services to make sure that they are the, um, the heart of our strategy still, because it is really important. We couldn't operate in London without getting our public transport services back to their normal um, mode of operation, um, but to make sure that they are green and clean and to rapidly roll out our electric bus um, programme. So key for us is to have learned from COVID, but also to make sure that we can capture some of the big benefits of COVID, particularly in terms of air quality and CO2 reduction. Thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, presentation. And we hear that the congestion charges are being uh, newly adopted and uh, enhanced and uh, as alternative uh, transportation, micro mobility, bicycles and uh, walking and demand responsive uh, transportation are being introduced. So it seems that uh, new policies are coming out. We have heard the four presenters and thank you very much for your presentations. Listening to the presentations, I can recall two major keywords. First, the preparedness of the city governments and the citizens' participation. I think these two are the key factors in overcoming the COVID-19 crisis. Once again, thank you for your presentations. Next, uh, I would like uh, to carry on the discussions on how we can create a sustainable public transport and how cities uh, can cooperate together uh, to deal uh, with crisis. Uh, we have two panelists uh, today. We have uh, Secretary General Mohamed Mugzani of UIPT, and uh, we also have Global Director uh, Gwanda Chen of our Transport Practice of World Bank Group. Uh, please uh, limit uh, your remarks uh, within five minutes and tell us uh, how we can create a more sustainable public transport and uh, how we can foster cooperation among cities. Secretary General Megzani, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm very honored to talk to you today. I represent uh, the UITP, the International Association of Public Transport. It's uh, 135 years old organization gathering 1,800 public transport operators, regulatory authorities, and supplying industry companies from 100 countries in all continents. And we are happy to have the Seoul Metropolitan, Metropolitan Government and other Korean organizations as 
members in our association. So as it was said, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has put more than 4 billion people in lockdown with mobility limited considerably. Uh, it has impacted public transport networks drastically. The impact uh, has resulted in a decrease of ridership. In some cities, it surpasses 90%, and, and a decrease in fare box revenues. Uh, moreover, this public transport network, they had to, uh, to, 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 cover, to cover additional costs needed to disinfect and implement uh, physical distancing uh, in, in public transport vehicles and in stations. Uh, and, uh, uh, also, waiving fares to help riders during the crisis uh, have lasting repercussions on transit budgets. And this uh, disinfection and cleaning, of course, it's needed to uh, restore trust and welcome back uh, passengers. Uh, but it comes with a very high cost. For example, in uh, RATP, the Paris public transport operator, uh, they increased their disinfection budget from 90 million in uh, euros in 2019 to 210 million in 2020. So during the lockdown, public transport services have been maintained uh, despite, uh, despite the reduction of travel demand to keep service continuity in order to serve essential workers and healthcare personnel. So in other words, the coronavirus crisis has proven how fundamental to a city public transport really is. Now, most countries have started progressively lifting the lockdown and uh, swiftly resuming uh, operation. Generally speaking, governments have called citizens and businesses to limit uh, mobility and uh, to limit crowds in public transport systems. And, uh, and here I want to, to talk about this physical distancing and the wearing of masks because the rules have been approached in a different ways according to the countries. Uh, but I would say imposing physical distancing in public transport vehicles means operating them using only 20% of their capacity. It means uh, eight or 10 people in a bus and, uh, and one person per square meter in a metro. So obviously this is impossible to enforce with the resumption of the economic and social activities in cities. Uh, and I would say we need, we need the proven facts to define a common approach. The recent study published by the US magazine Science shows that in Japan, no infection events were found linked to commuter trains after performing rigorous contact tracing on almost 17,000 confirmed cases. So this is because most of the passengers travel without speaking with the other passengers and the very large majority wear masks. So as you can see, this is, has nothing to do with physical distancing. Uh, we hear also high ranking governmental officials calling explicitly to avoid public transport. Uh, while there is not a single scientific study showing it is more risky to catch the virus in public transport compared to other public spaces. So this is, of course, damages the, the, the image of, the, of public transport. And we have even uh, seen some political leaders calling to drive more. Actually, this is a very short-sighted view of which uh, the effect would be more adverse than the coronavirus in the long term. So we all have seen these empty streets and roads during the lockdown and the huge space reserved for cars. So we should resist the temptation of short-term solutions uh, in response to the present crisis that will encourage people to leap back into their cars. Uh, we all know the car traffic nuisances in terms of pollution, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, road accidents and congestion. And unfortunately, these nuisances haven't disappeared with the crisis. So we should not forget also that the COVID-19 is a respiratory disease. According to the World Health Organization, poor air quality worsens the impact of the virus. Uh, I would say it's excellent to see people walking and biking more. So let's take now the needed measures uh, to make them do it safely and avoid an increase in car, in car traffic. Uh, it's the right time to consider, for example, congestion charging schemes and mm -hmm. restrict parking in cities. So this COVID crisis uh, should not make us lose sight, lose sight of the persisting climate and ecological crisis. Uh, we need to maintain the ambition and cut global emissions at the pace consistent to reaching carbon neutrality by 2050. So uh, we need a Green Deal compatible growth. And in this growth and this recovery, the use of public funds will be immense. immense. And now is the time to make the right political decisions. Uh, let me remind you that the economic benefit of public transport are five times greater than the money invested in it. So without clear conditions for using those funds in favor of a modal shift, we risk locking our cities in an unsustainable model 
of mobility for decades to come. Uh, this is very important. So, and, and in the meantime, if they manage to survive, public transport stakeholders, of course, will keep on showing the leadership and sense of responsibility they have always demonstrated, and in particular during this crisis, despite the financial losses they, they endure. They will care about their staff and travelers and implement the needed measures to serve them, reassure them, and restore trust. Thank you very much for offering me this opportunity. 네, 감사합니다. 그 말씀 주신 것 중에 저희가 이제 이런 yes, uh, 하지만, as you said, of course, uh, this is a crisis, but uh, we have we, we should not lose sight of a climate crisis as well as uh, other environmental crises. Uh, thank you very much for that remark. Thank you for very much. We will be hearing from Director Kwang Jie Chen. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this uh, gathering. I learned a lot from the uh, presentation, and I think this is one of those uh, um, uh, events that we should really do more, because I think we need to share experiences among ourselves, among cities. And here, obviously, we learn a lot from particularly uh, the East Asian uh, cities, because you're in the first phase of this uh, pandemic. And of course, uh, you all, these are the cities also experience uh, the SARS, uh, you know, decades ago. So you, you're more prepared. So I think those are experiences very really critical in terms of uh, for other countries and other cities to learn. And I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for uh, the Seoul municipal government to organize this session. And the World Bank, we're doing something uh, very really similar. Now, that being said, I, obviously a lot of good examples experienced here. Now, but among these four cities, one has to recognize this, uh, this uh, uh, city in, uh, in, uh, in the developed countries and high medical income countries. Now, at the World Bank, we work with many of the low income and uh, low middle income countries. And most of them, uh, to be honest, I think we know that they don't have the capacity neither operational, technical, financial capacity to do the many of the things that we're sharing today. That doesn't mean that the experience sharing is not important. It is important, but it's important from us, from a development perspective, to look at the, the sort of challenge that we're facing. Just in your mind, um, we call two images I'm sure you have seen uh, or heard about. One is the, at the end of March, uh, when India government uh, declared national lockdown. There were millions of people congregated in stations, public, station, public bus stations in, in New Delhi, trying to get home because they lost their livelihood, they lost their uh, uh, their residents, or so. But there's no capacity uh, to move them. So physical distancing is is a really difficult uh, challenge for them. Another image is just a couple of days ago. My colleague sent me a video from uh, Kolkata, uh, West Bengal, in the state of India where India has restarted the public uh, transport services, but want to introduce this uh, limited capacity. Uh, I think uh, Mohammed mentioned about 20, in fact, they talk about 20%. But the image I saw was the line, the ke people queuing for that buses was more than a mile or maybe two miles long. And that's certainly not sustainable. People would not have the patience to con continue doing that. And this would defeat the purpose. But and that being said, I think there's a lot we can share all these experiences, and some of them they can incorporate. But it's also pointing to the fact that international collaboration, international cooperation, technical assistance from well-off cities, more advanced to, to lower-income countries and cities, is very critical. And that's where you know, organizations like the World Bank can play an important role to facilitate that. Um, you might heard that in early April, the World Bank would announce $160 billion or package from April for the next 15 years to really the help country uh, to move to the next phase. Here, I want to just uh, build on my colleague who mentioned last message, is that moving forward, one has to recognize the COVID crisis will really determine the future urban mobility, not just for the coming year, but really for the coming decades. The way countries and cities respond and adapt to this crisis will have a long-term uh, fate uh, for the urban mobilities. Here, I would use two phrases. One is really we need to avoid the, what I would call it the vicious cycle of the urban mobility, which is the fact that you know many of the uh, uh, urban mobility operators could be financially in trouble. Some of them may be, may be bankrupt. And then, of course, with the, the physical distancing, we lower the capacity of urban mobility uh, from a public transport. 
and we could incent people to go to sort of uh, uh, passenger vehicles, and they were worsening the already bad worst situation of the carbonizing of the transport sector. And the withdrawal is sort of a cycle that we really want to aim at is really to build better, to not to raise the so-called a good crisis. Right? We're talking about walking, bicycling, but that require a much better city planning. Uh, transit-oriented developments to create a space for facility uh, for doing so. We're talking about, obviously, in low-income countries, we have to much improve their broadband connectivity so that home-based work to certain, in, in, in certain countries will become more feasible. Nowadays, it's mostly in developed countries or well-off communities. And, of course, we want to discourage uh, people to commute by cars and create a necessary travel. So all these uh, are, are really contributing factor for moving to a, a ritual cycle of a much better urban mobility since uh, in the future. So that's all I want to say. I know the time is running out. Thanks very much for, for this opportunity, Shay. Thank you very much uh, for that remark. Yes, uh, you made very important points. So COVID-19 uh, is not something that we should just uh, handle. We should try to use this opportunity to think down the road of a decade. And uh, today we heard only about four cities. And uh, they are mega cities, Beijing, Seoul, London, and Singapore. Uh, but we should consider other cities around the world. There are many other types of cities, and uh, these other cities should also participate in sharing of knowledge to uh, create a better mobility situation. And this should not just be about overcoming the coronavirus crisis. We should use this as an opportunity to prepare for a better uh, future mobility. And I think. Uh, this was the message that our four speakers and our two panelists uh, talked about. If we had more time, we would really like to have a longer discussion. But unfortunately, time does not allow us to go on with our discussion. And uh, the International Society uh, should pool our wisdom to uh, overcome the COVID-19 uh, crisis in a wise way, and uh, we should use this opportunity for uh, more international cooperation, and uh, I hope we have an opportunity like this again. And with this, we would like to conclude uh, the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you to our chairperson and our panelists for sharing inspirational ideas. I hope a sustainable and healthy public transportation culture to be settled to prevent the spread of COVID-19 outbreak through public transportations. So with the end of this discussion on public transportation, this concludes all program schedules of day four of Co Cities Against COVID-19 Global Summit 2020. And from 7.45 a.m. tomorrow, the discussion on Smart City will begin as the first program. So Please take your keen interest in tomorrow's programs as well. Thank you once again for being with us today. Thank you.